Hey, good evening, folks. Hey, TJ here at the Denver Public Library. And uh, this evening we're presenting a program on military insignia, commonly known as, as patches. And I brought with me uh, tonight a selection from the museum collection. And uh, these were donated to us last fall uh, by Post 9, the Lester Chase Post 9 here in uh, Derry. Uh, in the old Allegiant Hall, uh, they used to have plexiglass uh, tables set up. And underneath the plexiglass, uh, arriving members to the post would, would put a patch. And when the Legion home uh, closed down, all the patches were collected up and put into a box uh, where they sat for uh, many a year until this fall when uh, the post commander uh, brought them over to us at the museum. And upon receiving them, we were astounded at the variety and quality of the patches we received. Uh, this evening uh, for the program, I'll be talking about patches from all four of the services and the Coast Guard. And uh, seen here beside me are some of the patches we're going to discuss the evening. Uh, this uh, case contains some Air Force patches. Uh, these are modern patches, uh, with the exception of uh, this one, which is probably uh, circa 1950, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, the next case over has some Navy patches. These are some old, salty uh, Navy patches from the Second World War. And included amongst them here in the top right is a patch from a PT boat squadron. Uh, one, one more case over are some Army patches. Uh, these are also World War II era. And the one you see up in the top uh, left-hand corner is a patch for the China-Burma-India Theater. And down below is a Corps patch uh, representing the, the, the 20th Corps. In the last case, all the way over to uh, my right, are some patches from the United States Marine Corps. Uh, the Marines only wore patches from 1943 to 1948. So Marine Corps patches uh, are few and far between, and the majority that you see there are made after the war, and uh, serve more as a remembrance uh, for a Marine, and not something that he'd uh, wear on his uniform these days. So we hope uh, to see you uh, later on in the program. Uh, we'll be running through some slides, and uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Welcome everybody. I've seen most of you before, but as you know, or maybe you don't, I'm Sherry Bailey. I'm the person that schedules programs, and I was lucky enough to sucker TJ into coming tonight. Yay. <laughs> nice. um, at the end of the program, if you wouldn't mind, there are some evaluation forms back there. Please fill one out and let us know how you like this program, if you have any ideas for other programs or any comments. Um, I'm going to just turn the program over to TJ, call name. Um, I've got to run the reference desk tonight because we've got too many things going on in the building at the same time. So I'll be back before the end of the program, but I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry. Appreciate it. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, and welcome, everybody. And it's great to see you, and thank you for uh, braving the elements and uh, coming out to uh, take part in this uh, program this evening. Uh, we have a spectacular show on tap for you this evening. And I think I'm kind of crazy for doing this, but what we're going to try to do is jam about 45 years of history into the next 45 minutes. You will be flooded with facts, trampled with trivia, you will feel like your lips have been sewn to a fire hose and the hydrant unleashed on you. Um, and why am I doing this? Why am I subjecting you poor people of Derry to such an onslaught? Well, the method behind my madness is to impart on you what a wonderful legacy uh, this town has in its veterans. Um, there has not been a major campaign in a major war fought by elite units uh, from the big one in World War II all the way through of uh, the present day that has not been well represented uh, by the citizens of uh, this fine town. Now you could argue, any town could argue, well we've had a lot of veterans too and they've done a lot of great things. But I wonder how many of those towns can prove it. When it comes to talking schmack, as the veterans like to say, uh, they're all from Missouri, the show me state, you know, show me. Well, we can show you, ladies and gentlemen, we have a wonderful collection. It was donated to us 
by, uh, or loaned to us, I'm sorry, I we just had to do the paperwork last night, as a matter of fact, uh, by our, our representatives from our own Lester Chase, uh, Post 9. And um, for many years, uh, over at the Post Home, uh, there were tables set up, and the tables were covered with plexiglass. And as a veteran would join the organization, he'd take one of his patches, and he'd slip it under the plexiglass. And it kind of grows on you. You walk in and you see, what, third division's patch here? Those suckers? <laughs> Let me put down this fourth division patch. Everybody knows the fourth division is the best. And so it would go. So over the years, from let's say circa 1943 right up through uh, Vietnam, all these patches were collected. And when the post home was closed, uh, they were gathered up and they were put in, well, a shoebox. And, uh, and that shoebox uh, made its way to the Derry Museum uh, just last month. And uh, that coincided with Sherry putting out a distress call for a speaker. Because over the holidays, it's tough to arrange uh, for speakers. So we said, geez, what, how convenient. We just received this wonderful collection. And uh, why not uh, share this find with uh, the people of the town? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start. We have, of course, the, some of the patches. This is just a small uh, represent, representation of what the, the collection um, entails. Uh, we're going to run through a whole bunch of slides. And the slides are just filled with so much information that if you're an inveterate note taker, you're, you're, you're going to have gray matter streaming out of your ears. So, so don't worry. Don't worry about that. Because why? Because the patches aren't going to go anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Mark, the museum curator, and uh, Rick, the town historian, we're here for you at any time on a Sunday afternoon. If you want to mosey on over to the, uh, the museum and sit down, we can talk patches to your heart's content. And when the museum closes, we can move over to the Halligan Tavern across the street and continue the conversation. Um, afterwards, if uh, you'd like my uh, phone number or email, uh, I'd be happy to uh, share it with you. And um, if there's a certain aspect of the program that you think is worthy of more attention, then maybe you could um, plant a, a bug in, in Sherry's ear, and we'll, we'll come back and we'll just talk about uh, a certain uh, era of history uh, that may be of um, interest to you. So what we're going to start off our conversation with looking at army patches and how army patches were worn. And we have a patch-laden Ike jacket up here uh, for everybody's uh, perusal. So the... Uh, this jacket, the design of this jacket, actually originated in wartime England. And it is a measure of austerity. As you can see, it's been greatly cut down. Uh, the skirt, if you will, has been, has been chopped <coughs> off. The big brass buttons that one's accustomed to seeing on like the Army and the Marine Corps uh, uniforms are gone. Um, and it's, it's, it's designed for economy. And this particular jacket was uh, uh, a first sergeant's jacket, circa 1945, so the late World War II era. And the Army and the Marines have a proliferation of sergeants that if you're not familiar with it, can just make your head hurt. There's five different kinds of sergeants in the Army alone. Um, so it's good to think of terms and sometimes in pay grades. So the lowest pay grade in the Army is, is E1. That is a private. And that private doesn't even have a mosquito wing stripe on his uniform. He's the lowest of the low. And then on the other end, you have E9. That's the highest pay grade. And that would be a sergeant major. This uh, gentleman was a first sergeant. So he would be a PA grade E8, one underneath the sergeant major. And uh, you can tell. You were a TJ, right? What's that? Yeah. yeah that's what you were. <laughs> I could only dream. But we know he's a first sergeant uh, from his big chevrons here. So there's three up. These are called the, uh, the rockers, and three down, the rollers. And the diamond of the, of the top sergeant in the outfit. So uh, if there was no diamond, this would just be a, a master sergeant. But the top sergeant would be a company commander's right-hand man. So a company is an organization in the Army of about 100 individuals. And it's commanded by a captain. And that captain needs someone to actually run the company for him. All the day-to-day -day details. And that person 
is the first sergeant. So the first sergeant, uh, this first sergeant was assigned to the 13th U.S. Army Corps. Uh, this uh, particular organization was, was formed in 1942 down in Providence. And it landed in, um, in Europe in 1944, and it fought its way from the Netherlands all the way to the Elbe, Elbe River in eastern Germany. And if we look on the other stripe, on the other sleeve, uh, we see that um, earlier in the war, the first sergeant um, served with uh, the Supreme Headquarters, uh, even higher than the Supreme Allied Expeditionary Force. This is the European Command. And we know from these service stripes, also known as Hershey Bars, that he served for two years because each stripe represents six months of service overseas. And we know that the first sergeant served with some crack units because he was awarded the meritorious unit com uh, accommodation, um, sometimes just referred to as the muck. So this guy had a muck on his sleeve, the meritorious uh, unit com com uh, accommodation. So that's how uh, an example on the Army, for instance, on how the patches uh, were worn on the uniform. Now after the war, long after the war, in about 1956, uh, the German army was reformed. And uh, they joined NATO, and to make sure they fit in with the NATO <coughs> crowd, they adopted a version of the Ike jacket. And the Germans, known for their rather fanciful uniforms, were aghast at this particular jacket. And they called it the Affenjacke, or monkey suit. <laughs> because to them, it, it looked like the little suit that the, the monkey wore of the, of the organ grinder. <laughs> you, know, you know the organ grinder and he had the monkey? So that's what they called it. They also called it the Queen Louise after a cruise ship. Because when you sit down in this uniform, it rides up on the back and you get a little tail breeze. So for the Germans, it was called the monkey suit or the Queen Louise. So the trivia has begun, okay? Yeah. You've been warned. You've been warned. All right, let me dig into the slides, and uh, we've already kind of covered the second slide here, uh, which went over how the, the patches came into the possession of the Derry History Museum. And uh, again, I'd, I'd really just like to thank the veterans. Um, over the past uh, few months, we have just our cup overfloweth with wonderful donations from both uh, Post 9, represented by Commander uh, Kevin Gurley here, and by the VFW uh, post uh, 1617. So the veterans have been showering us with uh, all kinds of goodies, pictures, newspapers uh, from the era, and we are very, very, very grateful uh, that the veterans um, have put enough uh, trust in the, in the town museum uh, to preserve these um, and, uh, and to give us uh, this legacy. And we have a preview of coming distractions, okay? <laughs> Um, the veterans have also um, imparted on us some trophies uh, that were captured in battle uh, from the Germans and from the Japanese to include machine guns. And uh, we're going to uh, get these out on display at a time when we uh, make sure that we can do so in a safe manner, not put the community in any danger, and, and make sure we secure these very, very valuable um, trophies uh, that our, our guys from Derry captured. Um, from the enemy. So uh, the bounty uh, continues. But tonight, we're going to focus on patches. So I'm going to begin the presentation with five patches. And what these patches are, are my patches, are my favorite patches from each branch of the, the Army. So we're going to start off with my favorite Army, my favorite Navy, my favorite Marine, my favorite Air Force, and my two favorite Coast Guard patches. And we, we do have Captain Brown here, so I've got to make sure I don't diss the Coast Guard in any way, shape, or form, because I will be at the captain's mast, or lashed, or something <laughs> or other. I don't know what the Navy does. They're very brutal, the sea services. No, we do, we do captain's mast. Okay. And I was very hard. I bet you were. <laughs> I bet you were. TJ. Yes, ma'am. Could you move Queen Louise? Oh, sure. Move the Queen Louise jacket? So we can see the screen. Oh, okay, sure. Thank you. Sorry, First Sergeant. You have to stand off to the side there. How are we doing, Mike? Okay? All right. Okay, five of the finest. And I'm going to start off with the China Burma India patch. Um, and if you look at uh, Mark, 
Master Marino's jacket here, you'll see he's wearing a replica of the CVI patch because his dad served in that theater uh, during World War II. So this patch is great because it has a great story on it. We know why this patch was designed, where it was designed. And it may come as a terrible shock uh, to some of you to know that this patch originated in a windowless bar on the northern plains of India after a tremendous Donnybrook between American and British soldiers. But I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Uh, the CBI, uh, the China-Burma-India China Theater, was commanded by an irascible character known for his sunny disposition called General Vinegar Joe Stilwell. And Vinegar Joe was a real pip, as they say. I don't know if any of you have ever heard the fractured Latin phrase, illegimenti non carverendum, which is loosely translated as, don't let the bastards wear you down. <laughs> and that, that phrase was coined by Vinegar Joe. Vinegar Joe had another quirk. He hated horses. When asked about horses, he gets remarked, well, good eating if you're hungry. <laughs> he also said of horses, all prance and fart and no sense. The same has been recently remarked about, about the politicians up in Concord. But <laughs> I digress. <laughs> So Vinegar Joe had as his right-hand man a complete opposite character, Frank Pinky Dorn. Frank, uh, General Dorn, was born in San Francisco, and he was a very accomplished linguist, scholar, author, and artist. It, early in the, way before the war broke out, Frank Dorn stayed for three years with the Negrito people of the Philippines, and wrote a monograph of their language and customs, which he shared uh, with universities around the world. He also became fluent in Chinese. And uh, during the Sino-Japanese War, he freely moved between the Chinese and the Japanese lines, which was to become very handy, because later he would be commanding a force of nationalist Chinese soldiers against uh, the Japanese. So, I know the Marines back there are getting anxious. Well, tell me about the bar brawl. Okay, all right, we've arrived. <laughs> when Stilwell got to Burma, he arrived just in time for the front to completely collapse. And he ended up walking 100 miles out of Burma at the head of his staff of 100 people. When he reached northern India, uh, he reported to the British headquarters. And he established himself and his staff and gradually, American forces started trickling in. But the supplies were not keeping up with the American soldiers who were arriving. So the Americans had to wear British uniforms, the British summer uniforms that were adapted to that theater. And when the British and the Americans were drinking after hours, there would sometimes be a Brony Brook. But when the MPs came in, both the, the British MPs and the American MPs, they would just use their billy club on whoever they could see. There was no discerning who started the fight, the British or the Americans. And this was having a terrible, terrible effect on morale. So Vinegar Joe grabbed Pinky, the artist, and said, we gotta do something about this. Make me a patch so we can tell the difference between the Americans and the British. So Pinky sat down and using the US shield as his inspiration, he added the star of the nationalist Chinese, the Kuomintang, and, or the sun of the Kuomintang, and the star of, the, uh, of India. Now somebody asked him, well, what about Burma? What was the symbol of Burma? And he says, well, that's a peacock, and there's no way in hell the peacock's going on this patch. And besides, we just lost Burma anyway. <laughs> so, for the CBI, they ended up with uh, the sun of the nationalist Chinese, the Star of India over the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Shield, and that is the story of how one army patch came into existence, and it just happens to be one of my favorites. All right, we're going to move on now to the Navy. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we do, um, we have a picture of a dairy man, Thomas Grady, an East Dairy man, and you can see in the picture he's proudly wearing a CBI patch on his leather jacket. Sergeant Grady was, a, was an aviator, a decorated aviator, uh, being awarded the Distinguished Flying Medal and the Air Medal. 
a graduate of uh, both Pinkerton and the Vesper School of Art down in New York. So this guy was definitely in the Pinky Dorn uh, type of soldier. Uh, but as we saw from uh, the medals that he was awarded, uh, he put down the brush and wasn't afraid to pick up a machine gun uh, when the time uh, came. And um, Sergeant Grady also had two brothers and a sister who served in the war. Uh, TJ? Sir? I'm sorry, but the distinguished flying cross to a sergeant in World War II, that wasn't handed out with midnight rations. He really had to be good. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah, and, and we're going to see a sailor who did the same thing that we're coming up here. That's, and Peter, you're absolutely correct. Online, there's a, I think, an hour interview with him. Oh, no kidding. Wow, that's great. That's great. Yeah, okay. His sister was uh, Ruth Grady Wheeler, who was secretary at Pinkerton Academy oh, for many wow. years. She served in the last. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Great stuff. Well, thank you very much. Now, this patch just made it into the collection about two weeks ago. It was donated to us by the town historian, Rick Holmes. And it's a wonderful uh, patch, and it depicts a mosquito uh, hoisting up, or torpedo. Um, in World War II, uh, the PT boats, the small PT boats, are sometimes referred to as mosquito boats. Because in theory, they could buzz around the big ships, the destroyers, get under their guns, get under their radar, and launch torpedoes at them. But in practice, we found out that the, it don't, didn't always work that way. The torpedoes boats, the PT boats, were made out of wood. And when they got to the, the Pacific, they attracted a lot of marine growth to the bottom of the hull, which slowed them down considerably. They also found out that uh, they had to get within a mile or two of, of the destroyers for their torpedoes to be effective which was well in the range of the Japanese gunners. So becoming a PT boat captain in World War II was a very hazardous uh, profession. Um, and we all recall the president, who was it? John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. PT boat number, hull number? 109. 109, look at that, huh? Children of the 60s. <laughs> That's good, okay, extra credit. What happened to PT 109? Got cut in half by cut the half. destroyer because at that time, the captain didn't know what he was doing. Later, he learned and did very well. Okay, okay. And extra extra credit, the name of the Japanese destroyer? Anybody? Okay. Amagiri. Ended in I. Amagiri, the <laughs> heavenly mist, was not heavily, heavenly, when it came out of the mist and, and cut JFK's uh, PT boat in half. But uh, this, this particular patch uh, belonged to uh, Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 31, uh, which saw a lot of active service uh, later in the war uh, in the Solomons, the, the Marianas, and uh, in Okinawa. And it's just a great patch. It's a little bit dirty. There's some thread sticking out of it, and maybe a little bit of an oil smear. And it just is so evocative of uh, the South Pacific and what, what those guys uh, went through. So thank you, Tom Nistoyne, for imparting this part of the treasure on us. Next up, the Marine Corps. All right, Kevin, I know you were waiting. Why, the, why didn't we have to listen to the Navy before the Marines? Okay. <laughs> um, this particular patch, the Marines were not big on patches, per se. They, they wore divisional patches, but only from 1943 to 1948. And then they pretty much stopped wearing patches. But off-duty, they would wear patches. Um, they'd put them on a motorcycle jacket or maybe uh, a set of fatigues that was set aside for special occasions. And this is a Vietnam era patch uh, from the 1st Battalion, the 9th Marines. And this was a hard fighting unit. As a matter of fact, it suffered the highest rate of casualties of any other Marine Corps unit uh, deployed uh, to Vietnam. Very, very high casualties. We're talking 93% of the, of the Marines that served in this unit over uh, about a three year period were killed in action. So uh, they took on uh, the rather uh, sad name, if you will, the Walking Dead, because so many of them uh, were, were lost in, in action. And as you can see, the middle of the, of the patch is the Grim Reaper and, um, and the insignia of 1-9. So they never lost a battle, 
but they did lose a lot of Marines uh, during the fighting. But they could not win against the bureaucrats. And the 1st Battalion, the 9th Marines, fell victim to sequestration and was deactivated uh, this past summer. Uh, some of you um, are well aware of our, our, our Derry Marines uh, that are serving today, especially Lance Corporal Mike Geary, uh, who fell fighting in, in 2010. And he was assigned to the sister battalion of 1-9, the 2nd Battalion of the 9th Marines. And about a month uh, before Mike uh, fell in action, another Marine in Fox Company of 2-9 Marines was uh, awarded the Medal of Honor for uh, shielding his buddies from a hand grenade that was uh, thrown over the, the sandbags. So the 9th Marines as a regiment, a very, very uh, distinguished unit, and we're very happy to have uh, part of their heritage in, in our collection. Uh, TJ, you know, I ought to shut up, but... Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Ray. <laughs> when I was at the Coast Guard Academy, the Roman Catholic chaplain, Father Norbert Hart, had been chaplain in Vietnam for the Walking Dead. Oh, no kidding. Wow. And one time I asked him, I saw he had a purple heart. How'd he get that? And he said, he started joking. I said, I was caught in the nurse's barracks. And, <laughs> but and I said, now come on, Father, tell me what happened. Yeah. And the uh, Marines were being bombarded at night. Mortar incoming, you know. So he's evacuating the wounded, and praying for the dead, or the wounded. And, yeah. Finally, he gets into a bunker, and he's running around with a battle helmet in his skivvies. And, Gets into a bunker finally, and it, the uh, some jarhead marine. No disrespect. Yeah. My both my parents were marines. Uh, <clears throat> he uh, looking at him and said, you know, and just staring at him. And you know, father said in his usual way, uh, "What tells my way? You ever seen a chaplain in his skivvies before?" And he points at his foot. It's got oozing blood from a shrapnel wound that he wasn't even aware of. Wow. Anyhow, I just... That's adrenaline action. Fa yeah. Father Ricard died a few years ago. I just feel wow. inclined to say that. Sorry. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. That's, that's what it's all about. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. All right. This... Um, we'll, we'll move on to a little bit of a lighter subject now. <laughs> this patch is, is my all-time favorite. Um, and it's right here in the case, uh, I think in the first case in the lower right. It's a beautiful patch, and um, it was one of these off-duty patches uh, that was uh, made for a security policeman assigned to the air base in the infamous Thule Greenland. And uh, the design of the patch is just beautiful. It's handmade. Um, you can see, of course, the polar bear, but if you look around the air police, They've also incorporated elements of the Northern Lights in the design as well. So it's just a beautiful patch, and it was probably worn like on a, on a varsity letterman's jacket uh, by the policeman uh, up there in, in Thule, Greenland. And here's a, here's a picture of a lovely uh, Thule Air Base. So um, we've had somewhat of a cold winter uh, this year. But in January in Thule, Greenland, uh, the average ambient temperature is uh, two below during the day and 16 below at night. But they are subject to heat waves in August when it gets up around 45. And uh, everybody, you know, post puts on their t-shirts. But 750 miles north, north of the, uh, the Arctic Circle. And the base is still in existence now. And if you uh, tick off this guy, with the stripes, you might find yourself assigned to Thule, Greenland. Uh, where right now, where they're mostly uh, concentrated on missile defense. All right, Ray, here we go. The Coast Guard has a very, very serious mission. But as a service, they have a tendency not to take themselves too seriously. So there are no uh, Grim Reapers or <laughs> torpedoes or uh, tridents or anything here. Um, we have uh, a couple of patches, uh, probably not worn on the duty uniform. I don't know. Ray could maybe elaborate. Uh, but I love this one with Elvis. Um, Elvis, if you're out there, we'll find you. Okay. Now that is talking some dedication. Okay, to duty here. So uh, I love the Coast Guard uh, every day. Uh, they're out there 
uh, saving lives. Um, the unofficial motto being, you have to go out. You don't have to come back. So while we're, everybody's running for the hills at the hurricanes, they're uh, getting the rotary rings ready to fly into the maw uh, to rescue those who, uh, who didn't make it out. And I'm sure we're all aware of the, uh, of the heroism that the Coast Guard yeah. exhibits day to day, day in, day out. Never funded enough, never get enough money, but they do the job. Now, trivia time. Elvis, did he wear a patch when he was in the service? And what service was it? Army. 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 Okay. All right. Here we go. Elvis, in uniform, 32nd Armored Division, or Armored Regiment, and he would have wore the 3rd Armored Division patch. <coughs> and he was a very good soldier. Elvis was a very, uh, very good soldier, very conscientious. And uh, you can see his uh, deportment is immaculate. The first sergeant would have been very helpful. Very happy with how Sergeant Presley turned out in the morning. Okay. All right, so those are the top five. What we're going to do now, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to go on that magical mystery ride that I told you about earlier, okay? We're going to start in World War II, and we're going to work all the way up to Vietnam. It's going to be kind of Army heavy because the Army, they wore the most patches. But I didn't leave out the other services. And uh, hold on to your hats, because here we go. The big one, ladies and gentlemen. So we're going to start off with some infantry divisions. And uh, I could probably spend 45 minutes just talking about each and every uh, division uh, that's represented up there. Um, up in the upper left, we see the big red one, the BRO, uh, one of the oldest and most distinguished uh, divisions. I'm going to spend some time a little bit later on the Indian Head Division, the Warriors of the Second Division. The third division, the Rock and the Marne, uh, got their name from uh, a, uh, a series of battles they fought in the First World War. The guys who wore that patch usually called themselves the Barber Pole Division. Moving down here to the Ivy Division, when they were thinking that one up in the First World War, the general said, hmm, how do you write the Roman numeral four? And the, the orderly said, well, it's an I and a V. Pling! There you go, the birth of the Ivy Division. The Sightseeing Six got their name from the way they moved around uh, France during the First World War. The Pathfinders, uh, they somehow derived their nickname from John C. Fremont and his explorations in California. But a quick story about the Pathfinders, and I, I used to be a Pathfinder, so I have to brag about my division. But during World War II, they were commanded by another one of these characters, of the Vinegar Joe Stillwell mold. This guy's name was Skull Canham. Now Skull got his nickname is because he was cadaverously skinny and the skin around his face was stretched over to the extent that he looked like a skull. And he was a real pepperoni of a general, uh, acerbic uh, at the Vinegar Joe Stillwell mode, uh, but a very, very tough fighter and a very, very skilled fighter. And um, he was selected, uh, the, the 8th Division uh, in World War II surrounded the town of Brest in France and compelled the Germans to surrender. And out to accept or to give the surrender of the town came a three-star uh, German general, Hermann Bernard Ramka. And this guy was festooned with iron crosses and every other thing, and he walks up to Skull Canham and he goes, what? A one-star general? Show me your credentials, please. And Skull just looked over his back at the GIs behind him and said, these are my credentials. <laughs> and that became the motto of the 8th Infantry Division. These are my credentials. The Old Reliables of the 9th uh, Division uh, made a real name for themselves in Vietnam fighting in the Mekong Delta. And after Vietnam, they became the Experimental Division for the Army. And they're sometimes referred to as the Toys R Us Division because every new moon buggy or moon rocket or whatever that came out was tested by the 9th Division. And you have uh, the 10th Mountain, which was old Bob Dole's division. Bob Dole served with the 10th Mountain. Um, in the middle here we see a dairy soldier who uh, unfortunately was killed in action. Uh, Sergeant Char uh, PFC Charles E. Preston, uh, who served with the 3rd Division, so he wore the Rock of the Mine patch. And while he was fighting, 
In France, his father was a Navy CB serving in the Admiralty Islands. So just again shows uh, the extent of uh, Derry's commitment uh, to uh, the country in, in fighting its wars. Um, staying on with the, uh, the infantry divisions, uh, there's more of them. There was, you know, six million men under arms in World War II for the Army. Uh, we have the AmeriCal Division that got its name because it was the first division uh, formed in the Pacific on the island of Caledonia. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, Colin Powell served in that, in that unit. Uh, moving down to the Victory uh, Division, uh, we have, uh, in the 25th, you have two divisions that have the taro leaf on it. The taro leaf is, uh, uh, the taro tree grows in Hawaii. So these, both of these divisions were originally organized in Hawaii. Uh, moving down at the bottom, we have the uh, famous Yankee Division, which is uh, the New England National Guard Division. Lester Chase himself uh, was a member of uh, the Yankee Division, as was my father and my uncle. The Keystone uh, Division was the Pennsylvania National Guard. Um, Old Hickory, we're going to talk about them. Uh, there was a few dairymen who made a good name for themselves serving with the, uh, the 30th Division. And the same with the, uh, the Red Bull. The Red Bull Division landed on Anzio and uh, got bogged down. But there was one unit called the, the Red Raiders that would sortie out from the beachhead every night, uh, raiding uh, the German positions. And one of those raiders was, was a man from Derry. Has everybody here seen uh, the old Clint Eastwood movie, uh, Kelly's Heroes? Mm -hmm. Kelly's Heroes, they wore the patch of the Santa Fe Division. So more trivia thrown at you. How you doing? Hanging in there with me? Yeah, everybody my okay? My wife's uncle. Oh, really? Yeah? Something. Oh, really? Okay. And he made it. He made yeah. it through. Yep, he made it through. Okay, moving on. Uh, this will be the final little Army divisions. I know uh, the Navy guys are getting a little bit itchy. Oh, man, more Army stuff, for crying out loud. Uh, the 69th Division uh, was the first one to make contact with the Russians, to shake hands with the Russians at the, at the Elba River again. Uh, and it was also, if you ever watched the Phil Silver show back in the 60s, Sergeant Bilko? Sergeant Bilko wore the patch of the 69th Division. We had the red circles, and then down here on the 76th Division was the Onaway Division. How the heck did they get that name? Well, before they left the war, the, the 76th Division was training in Michigan on the, the grounds of the uh, Chippewa Indians. And the Chippewas had an alert saying, Onaway meant that the enemy was coming and to look out. So that's where they took their motto from. The Cross of Lorraine, uh, they took that from uh, their service in the First World War in France. They had the tough hombres. That is a T and an O. So that division was mostly made up of Texans and Oklahomans. <laughs> there must have been some windless bars when those guys went out after duty hours, I'm sure. And then the nine fours, the Nufkats. The Nufkats, so the nine fours. That was uh, another um, division that after the war settled in, in Massachusetts. And after the war, they, they designed another patch to replace the good old nine four. They went with a pilgrim carrying a blunderbuss. And I had the misfortune to wear that patch myself at Fort Bragg during airborne school. So I got up to this tower where we practiced jumping out of the plane. It's a 35 foot tower, and it's basically a zip line. And you stand in the door of the tower, like you're gonna jump out of the plane, you hook up, and you jump, and you grab your reserve chute and you go, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, check canopy to make sure the chute opens. Well, the Green Beret up there said, what the hell kind of patch is that? What do you work for, Frank Purdue and his chicken factory? Get the hell out of here, boy. And he throws me out of the thing. I, there was no 1,000, 2,000. Like, ah! So I got a no-go on that and had to do a lot of push-ups, but I don't know why they changed from the 9-4 to the fighting pilgrim, but I did live to regret that change personally. Okay. I talked about Old Hickory. Uh, Old Hickory was a division made up of soldiers mainly from Tennessee, North and South Carolina, and Georgia. And uh, they took their name from Andrew Jackson, 
a famous soldier of, uh, of days gone by. And these two um, uh, dairy uh, soldiers acquitted themselves quite well, well assigned to the Old Hickory Division, with Corporal McGregor here uh, receiving the Silver Star uh, for gallantry in action, and Corporal McDuffie uh, receiving uh, the Bronze Star. And Corporal uh, McDuffie, uh, his job was to run back and forth as a messenger. Sometimes he would be on foot, sometimes he'd be on a jeep, but whether he was running or driving, he was the target of the German artillery because if he ever got back to the main lines, he could do a lot of damage with the current intelligence that he was bringing back. But he, uh, he took on that task and he executed very well and he was decorated for his services. Ah, the armored divisions, Patton's boys. So we had a lot of, uh, of dairy um, men who drove the tanks and I'm happy to report that the tanks, as they cut across Europe, were chopping down the fences surrounding the concentration camps. And the 20th Armored Division, as a matter of fact, um, they ran down the, the gates of Buchenwald and uh, liberated uh, those prisoners there. And along with the man from Derry was a staff sergeant by the name of Charles Schultz, who uh, later went on to draw the Peanuts uh, cartoons. And there was a first lieutenant in the 20th Armored Division by the name of Spiro Agnew. Yes. Anybody remember him? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Now you can see this, uh, this tank here, a Sherman tank, um, uh, from the 4th uh, Armored Division. And you can see, to symbolize the 4th, they just wrote a 4 with a triangle. And that was Army shorthand for 4th Armored Division. And you can see how the, uh, the triangle uh, is, is sort of the, uh, the symbol of, of the armor. And you have the three colors, the cavalry, uh, the infantry, and the artillery, because all three elements were combined to form uh, an armored division. The chief weapon, of course, which was the tank. Airborne, all right, you heard my airborne story and uh, how TJ went from being a straight leg to a five jump chump. <laughs> Okay, so if you graduated from the Airborne School, you got your silver wings, but you weren't a real paratrooper until you went to one of these divisions and jumped out of a plane. So these are, are some of the storied uh, divisions of the, uh, the Second World War, the Band of Brothers, and, uh, and, and so forth. And we're going to talk a little bit more of them. Uh, this one here, the 13th Airborne Division, I had never even heard of until Kevin brought the box over and I was looking through it. And the 13th Airborne was organized in the States, but it never made it overseas uh, while the war was going on. So that's why we, we don't hear uh, too much of it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and, and talk about a couple of divisions here. I'm gonna start with uh, the famous 82nd Division. And I think most of the people here are, are very familiar with um, a ranger uh, from Derry by the name of Walter uh, Borowski. And uh, Walter Borowski was one of the rangers from the 2nd Battalion who scaled the cliffs at Point de Hoc to take out some guns, some German guns that had a bird's eye view of the landing beaches. But when they got up there, they discovered that the guns had been moved. And this is only after they scaled these sheer cliffs with grenades and bullets raining down upon them. But they did find out later on where the German guns were hidden. They did find them, and they did dispose of them. Um, but all the while, while, uh, while Walter Borowski was fighting with the Rangers, his brother, Jerry, had jumped in with the 82nd the night before. Now, everybody here has been to, to Rye Beach or Hampton Beach, right? And you know, it is a pain in the neck to get out of there on a 5 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. And why is that? It's because there's only so many roads that go out of there. And why is that? Well, because all the land behind the beaches are marshes. Well, that was the same in Normandy. You had the beach, but behind the beach were these marshes. And over the marshes were these bridges. So the 82nd and the 101st and British paratroopers were dropped in to secure these bridges because nobody could get off of the beach, like nobody can get off the beach in Hampton and Rye until you get over one of those bridges through the marshes. Now, 
some of the bridges were to be blown up so that the Germans couldn't counterattack, and some of them were to be held at all cost so the Americans could break out from the beachhead. So Jerry's outfit was sent to capture the bridges over the Murderay uh, River. And if anybody here has seen uh, Saving Private Ryan, at the climactic battle scene at the end, that is uh, derived from those battles that were fought to save, secure the bridges. So they did their last stand because if they didn't secure the bridge, the armor divisions that we saw earlier weren't going to be able to get out and, 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 and bring, you know, bring their sweep into, into uh, France. So Jerry jumped on June 5th, the evening of June 5th, and they took the bridges and they stayed in the line uh, because they were very, very effective um, soldiers. Uh, but they were going to be withdrawn back to England uh, for their next mission. And uh, the date for their withdrawal was, was July 11th. But unfortunately, um, Jerry uh, was killed uh, right around uh, July 5th, just about six days before they would have been withdrawn uh, back to England. So a very uh, poignant story for Derry on D-Day. Imagine that, two of our, our town sons uh, fighting uh, on D-Day, one with the Rangers and one with the Airborne. Now I'm going to talk about uh, another parachute regiment here, and everybody knows this guy, right? Rod Serling. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Rod Serling uh, was a member of this division, the 11th Airborne, as were a good many men from Derry. Now the 82nd and the 101st had the tendency to get all the publicity about all the fighting that happened in Europe. Well, the guys who were jumping and fighting out in the Pacific, for whatever reason, didn't, didn't seem to get as much attention. Um, the, the 11th jumped into the Philippines, and they were tasked with liberating Manila. But to get to Manila, they had to get through the Japanese Genko Line. And the Genko Line was very formidable. And why was that? Well, because we built it before the war. And when the Japanese took the Philippines, they took over our forts. But they had a very devious uh, twist to their defense of the line. They buried a bunch of depth charges taken from destroyers. Depth charges are used to, to blow up submarines, and they buried them. And as the Americans were just about to breach the Genko line, they detonated all of these depth charges. And it was a terrible, terrible scene. But in spite of these heavy casualties, the 11th Airborne was able to persevere and liberate uh, Manila. Uh, later on, they were uh, used in, uh, to liberate uh, Japanese prisoner war camps and detention centers. Um, and maybe uh, there was a movie out a few years ago called The Ghost Soldiers. And uh, that movie depicted the 11th Airborne. And believe it or not, there were citizens from Derry and Chester in these camps that would have, were freed by the 11th Airborne. And uh, that is a, a topic for another night, I'm afraid. All right, I'm going to just go ahead and dash through the Air Forces. As Kevin alluded to early, uh, for a long time, the Air Force was part of the Army. And I think it was 1947, actually, Kevin, before we let those guys escape, uh, much to our chagrin these days. But these are just wonderful patches. And you can kind of get like, kind of like that Art Deco uh, feel, you know, uh, just, just really wonderful pieces of, of folk art. And one of uh, the most famous of the Army Air Forces was the 8th Air Force stationed in England. And you can see uh, these are just a small sampling of the dairy men who served uh, with the 8th Air Force. And I'm not even including the pilots. There was a considerable amount of pilots, both bomber and fighter pilots from Derry, who served with uh, the mighty 8th. And look at this for strength. 185,000 strong. So they were worth 12 of those infantry divisions that I had shown earlier. And look what they could put up in the air at one time. 2,000 bombers and 1,000 fighters at one time in the air over Germany. Imagine that. Destructive power. Yes, sir. <coughs> the 8th Air Force was <coughs> excuse me, commanded by Jimmy Doolittle, who led the first raid. Oh, that's right. Command. Yeah, off the carriers. That's yeah. right. That's then right. he went over and commanded the 8th Air Force. Yeah, very, very uh, formidable um, 
division. Okay, we're finally at the Navy. We're in the Navy people, okay? All right. <laughs> so here are some, uh, some dairy sailors. And these pictures uh, were taken from uh, a newspaper called the Dairy Serviceman. So this, this newspaper was published from 1944 to 1946. And again, we, uh, they're on microfiche upstairs, but Rick Holmes uh, donated a copy uh, to the museum. They're kind of in rough shape, but uh, what a gold mine that they contain. And uh, again, show me. Yeah, Derry had a big showing in the war. Prove it. Well, okay. We got it in the newspaper, and we have it with this insignia here. So these are some uh, sailors. Uh, and uh, earlier we were talking about the Distinguished Flying uh, Cross and the Air Medal awarded to um, Staff Sergeant Grady. Well, here is an ordnance man. Uh, second class, Francis Lee, who earned them as a sailor. And I think he was probably uh, a rear gunner on a torpedo plane. And he probably splashed some of the Japanese zeros that were attacking uh, his, his torpedo plane. Yes, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I know something about that. I was a man I knew shortly before he died, oh, about 10 years ago. I was managed to get him the Distinguished Flying Cross long overdue. He was not only a, he was not only a rear tail gunner, he was also the radio man. Oh, okay, right. And uh, to get the Distinguished Flying Cross as an enlisted man in World War II was almost unheard of. And that just didn't happen. Uh, you know, I don't want to diminish anybody. Sometimes you see guys walking around with Bronze Star now and easy for an officer to do. Uh, that's, that's, that's unkind to say, but I mean, for a enlisted men to get the Distinguished Flying Cross in World War II, you really had to deserve it. Right, right. No, I agree. I agree. Fortunately, these, uh, um, Charles Singh was lost at sea, and, and Alan Hall, and again, another dairyman part of the story of dairy at D-Day. Uh, he was, you know, crewing a, a landing ship tank, you know, the, the, the vehicles that actually brought the soldiers to the beaches uh, when, when he was uh, killed in action. So we have some of the, the Navy patches, um, the famous CBs. So the CB is Construction Battalion, get it, CB? So that's how they got their name. And you see the famous insignia of the CB, so the front is holding the, uh, the machine gun and then he's got a, a wrench and another one of the claws and a and a hammer, and another one, and these guys were like the combat engineers of the Navy. When they would take an island, they need to put up an airfield, the CBs would go ahead and build uh, the airfield. Has everybody seen the old John Wayne movie, The Fighting CBs? Yeah. It's one of the few movies where the Duke gets killed. The Duke never likes to die in his movies, so when he does die, he goes out big. And I think, I don't want to ruin The Fighting CBs for anybody if you haven't seen it yet, but. Well, he drives a bulldozer into an oil tank to, to blow up this important Japanese position, so the Duke goes big. And of course, one of the men who was considered to be the father of the CBs was John Laycock from Derry. Mm. Is, is everybody been over the, the, the Taylor Library and met Ginny, one of the uh, librarians over there? Ginny was a CB. That's her. Oh. Oh. Well, I had two uncles who were CBs. Oh, wow, that's great, yeah. Well, the CBs were originally just private contractors. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, you're right. And the, and the movie kind of brings that out. Right. <laughs> and they sure know how to drink and fight. <laughs> yeah. That has been a recurring theme this evening. I'm not sure why that is. Okay, Leathernex, this is your time to shine here. And uh, the Marines well represented um, in Derry. Look at this photo in the middle there. Isn't that just so evocative of the Marines in the South Pacific? Uh, he's got his M1 carbine and uh, his helmet with the old frog skin uh, camouflage pattern. And uh, if this guy looks like he could deck you with a single punch, you, you would be correct because he was a prize fighter in the Marines and he won 62 out of his 64 bouts, uh, most of them through knockouts. And, uh, it looks like he's in fighting from there, would you agree? Yeah? Just, let's see, his 4th Marine Division, and again, I come from a Marine Corps family. The 4th Marine Division had only 41 days in combat, but suffered 60% casualties. Wow. 
Wow. wow. And we'll see, um, and again, uh, these, these Marines, you know, were, were wounded on Iwo in Okinawa, but, but made it through. And uh, to raise a point here, they, uh, these are the divisional patches uh, worn by the Marine Corps, but again, only for a very short time, only between 1943 and 1948. And uh, we have the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and uh, the sixth. Uh, so the patches still live on today, like if you drive on to, like, say, Camp Pendleton, Whatever division there, you'll see the patch painted on a sign, but they just That's don't the wear them on the, uh, the <laughs> uniform. Okay, good, good. And uh, there are other uh, organizations. Um, uh, for instance, the, the Fleet Marine Force, those are the, uh, or the Marine Air Wing, the, 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 the pilots and uh, the rear door gunners that we saw uh, in the Navy, uh, as well as those uh, who staffed uh, the, uh, the, the amphibious corps. And this dragon is just beautifully um, detailed. This, these two are original uh, World War II patches, very, very valuable and very, very uh, authentic. Just, uh, again, I feel like breaking out in Bloody Mary's chewing beetle nuts or something when I see this kind of stuff. It's, it's great. Okay, we're going to move on to um, Korea now. And uh, we're going to start with the, uh, the 7th Infantry Division. So this patch is uh, designed to look like the, uh, the Black Widow the Black Widow Spider, but the soldiers in the division call themselves the Crushed Bear Can Division, and uh, you can see how they got that. Um, when you look at this picture, you can say, well, how can you tell that it's not World War II? And there's a couple of things. First off, all, most of the soldiers are wearing flak jackets. So that was an innovation that came about in, in the Korean War, the first wear of the, the quote-unquote bulletproof vest, or the, the flak jackets. Um, another indicator there is the soldier in the middle there. He's an African-American. So by now, the, uh, the units have been integrated. In World War II, the units were still very strictly segregated. segregated. So now in Korea, we see the integration of uh, all the units uh, brought on by, by President Truman. And I just feel this soldier here has been wounded. I mean, you can just see he, he's about to collapse. It's, it's really a, a very uh, poignant photo, and there's a big ding in his helmet. So you wonder if he did, you know, uh, take some shrapnel. Uh, and thank God he was wearing his helmet and it stopped it. So the, the 7th Division, uh, known for its great stand in Port Chop Hill, and uh, the movie with Gregory Peck, um, some of you uh, might be familiar with that, that was uh, depicted this division. And uh, of course, the fight took place in 1953, and it was a, you know, pretty much, it wasn't going to change where the, the line was, but the Chinese kept pushing and pushing. They wanted more terrain, and we, we just had to stop them because we were at the table, you know, negotiating with them. And it was just such a terrible tragedy for all these 7th Division soldiers to be killed so close to when the armistice was going to be signed, just to prove to the communists that we weren't going to take any more of their guff, and we were going to stand for what we had captured. So very, very poignant um, uh, part of the, of the Korean War. Okay, the Rakasans, getting back to the paratroopers. Now what the heck does that mean? Well, the Rakasans um, were originally uh, the 187th uh, Regimental Combat Team. They were part of the 11th Division. Remember we talked about the 11th Airborne Division? Well, after the war, they kind of separated into uh, their own uh, outfit, if you will the uh, 187th Regimental Combat Team, and they were stationed on occupation duty in Japan. So the press officer uh, gets up to the crowd, and he, uh, he says, uh, we have an airborne division here, ladies and gentlemen, stationed in Japan. How do you say paratrooper in Japanese? Well, the way that the interpreter came up with it was, well, they're they're men who jump from the skies. They're falling down from the skies with umbrella. They're the falling down umbrella men. <laughs> that was translated, Rakasan means umbrella. So the guys in the unit got a real big kick out of it. And they said, yeah, hey, that's a great nickname. We'll call ourselves the Rakasans, the falling down umbrella men. So a very, very distinguished unit, as most airborne units were acquitted themselves uh, very well, and during the Korean War, they were commanded by this man, who's this, anybody recognize him? Westmoreland, Westie. Westie, and Westie was very proud of his service 
with the Rakasans and wore that patch as his combat patch, as his wartime unit patch. Okay, the Indian head, the warriors, and what is this monstrosity off to the left of the famous second division patch? Well, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, this patch uh, to the left is called a, a theater maid. So it was a patch made in country by the locals. And not anybody could get this patch. This patch was only awarded to a certain group of fighting men called the Imjin Scouts. And if you look closely, what is the shape of the patch? If you think about it, it kind of resembles the Korean Peninsula. And if you see this line that comes down the middle of the patch, that represents the 38th parallel separating communist North Korea from capitalist or democratic South Korea. Now you see the Indian here is repeated here, and then there's an arrowhead. And the arrowhead always means recondo, reconnaissance, and it's pointing where? Toward the north. So the Imjin scouts were right on the 30th, 38th parallel, the demilitarized zone. So they're right up on the river, but behind them, uh, right up on the DMZ, but behind them is the Imjin River. So they were effectively cut off from the rest of the Korean Peninsula. So they had to train very, very hard because the North Koreans to this day are infamous for the provocations that they make against uh, the DMZ. So during the Vietnam War, Ho Chi Minh reached out to Kim Il-sung and said, hey, can you make things a little bit exciting up there in Korea? and distract the Americans from Vietnam, and Kim Il-sung was only too glad to, uh, to uh, help out his communist brother down there in Vietnam. And there were over 900 uh, border attacks um, over the, the Korean, the DMZ, and 76 soldiers were killed uh, during that time. Uh, so it was a very, very, very arduous duty, and before you could be assigned to that little group, that little sector, you had to go through a very rigorous 23-day program, and at the conclusion of that program, you could wear the Imjin Scout Patch. And they're very, very uh, uncommon. They were only made between 1965 and 1991, but we have, thanks to Post 9, an Imjin Scout Patch in our collection. Okay, moving on to uh, Vietnam, and we're getting toward the end of the program there. Thank you for hanging with me so, so long. Uh, with all of this trivia being uh, shout out at you. Uh, it used to be called uh, America's Other Forgotten War, but uh, thank goodness the American public has come to its senses recently and has started, started uh, to give the Vietnam veterans um, the acclamation and the honor that they deserve and they were denied when they first came home. Uh, one of the iconic patches of, uh, of the Vietnam War was the 1st Cav Division. And uh, if you ever saw Apocalypse Now and, you know, The Flight of the Valkyries, uh, that, that part of the movie was dedicated to the 1st Cav Division. And the 1st Cav pioneered the use of helicopters in war for that very reason, to free the infantry, infantry from the tyranny of terrain. So they were the ones who pioneered what was then called the air mobile uh, tactics. And they did it uh, very, very effectively. Now, when the Americans... Oh, go ahead, Ray. Uh, sorry to do this. <clears throat> you mentioned Apocalypse Now. Oh, golly. Early 80s, I was at sea and operations officer. The captain had served in Vietnam in a patrol boat offshore. And, of course, part of that movie was going up the river. Right, Mark right, and right. All that. Groundwater Navy. Well, but my captain had been there. And... After, we were real to real movies back then, but he got up and left after the first reel and said, I was there, it wasn't like that, <laughs> and just couldn't, wow. couldn't, couldn't, yeah. couldn't watch it. And he'd been decorated in Vietnam, and he's still a close friend of mine, but I mean, ah, for what it's worth. Yeah, yeah. Now Hollywood uh, doesn't, doesn't get it right all the time, as we, as we all know. So the Americans landed on Vietnam wearing their nice, bright colored patches. And um, the Viet Cong said, oh, my goodness, what a handy target for us to shoot at. 
So just like we took advantage of the redcoats during the revolution, okay, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, when we first showed up, said, ah, well, we can see these guys coming through the bushes really nice with their nice colorful patches. So we soon caught on that, hey, these colored patches got to go. And the Army developed another version of the patch. It was called the subdued version. And that is the version that, that lived on from Vietnam on. We never wore full color patches on combat uniforms anymore. It was always a subdued patch. And now the patches look like desert tan, but they, uh, they continue on. Now this particular patch is, again, one of these theater-made patches. So there weren't enough in theater, so the guys would go downtown and have the local tailor make up their patch for them. So uh, they were cheap. Uh, the Imjin Scout patches went for uh, a quarter apiece at the local village, and 13 cents wholesale. <laughs> so uh, they were very, very inexpensive, but now these theater-made patches are highly sought after collector's items, and they're faked. There are, there are stores and, and tailor shops in Saigon now churning these things out by the thousands, and that's what you find on eBay, but to find a real one is really, really significant, and we have a lot of them in our collection, again, thanks to our veterans. The chargers, and again, just another, now what we see, what color is this patch, <laughs> okay? It used to be a nice, lovely um, blue and red and had some yellow in it. What it depicts is a cannon fuse lit at both ends. So these, uh, the chargers were one of these light infantry brigades that just specialized in jungle fighting and were able to equip themselves uh, very well against some of the best jungle fighters uh, in the war. But again, just bringing out, now you see the change starting to occur with uh, how the patches are made. Other patches uh, depict uh, the honors uh, or the qualifications uh, earned by the soldier. So the top one, the CIB, the Combat Infantry Badge, is only awarded to those soldiers who are in direct combat with the enemy. So it's a very, very coveted uh, patch and not one that's freely given. Uh, the second one there is a master parachutist. So you heard about my infamous experience at the Airborne School at Fort Bragg. I only made five jumps. To, to get that one, you had to go about 30 or 50 jumps. And you had to go through jump school where you were the guy who checked everybody before they went out the door. So again, and then finally the famous ranger tab. And uh, eight weeks down in Georgia. And uh, you don't sleep, you don't eat. And at the end of it, if you're still standing, uh, you're awarded the famous uh, Ranger Tab. But all of these, uh, again, were locally made by the Vietnamese and now are very, very sought after by collectors. Couldn't forget the Marines. Always got to go back to the Marines. And again, the Marines stopped wearing patches, but they still wore them informally on their flight suits. So the Marine Corps aviators, like the Air Force aviators, uh, would wear squadron patches. And this particular one comes from the 1st uh, Marine Composite Reconnaissance Squadron, or Squadron 1. And they flew these Sky Knight aircraft all around the Gulf of Tonkin. And these were filled with electronic jammers. So when the North Vietnamese would launch their missiles to try to shoot down our planes, these planes would send out signals so that the missiles would miss the planes. And it worked most of the time. <laughs> Uh, here's a, a patch that the GIs would get for a souvenir. And uh, it's kind of a rough humor, if you will, the Viet Cong Hunting Club. But what it depicts, as we see in the middle, is a, a Viet Cong uh, wearing a coolie hat. And the backdrop is the colors of the South Vietnamese flag. But if you look closely, he's in the reticle of a sniper's gun right here. So this was kind of like a joke patch that the guys would get, you know, to sew on their leather jackets when they came home. Made again by a local Vietnamese tailor for, uh, you know, a buck or 50 cents. And uh, it's kind of now uh, reached icon status. And again, it's fate to a great extent. But we have uh, a real one in our collection in the museum. Okay, we're almost at the end of our journey, ladies and gentlemen, and I thank you again for hanging in there. We're going to talk about the Twilight War, the Cold War, 
So we've, we've, we've heard about all these rough and tough guys picking their teeth with bayonets and jumping on St. Mary Gleese and blowing up the Ginkgo line. Here's a guy, a GI, who was stationed at a French palace, the palace at Fontainebleau, the Corps of Rigat, okay, the, the castle of Henry IV. Can you imagine? How, how do you score such duty? <laughs> One guy goes to Vietnam, the next guy, he's in Paris. Can you imagine that? So he's sitting down in the PX next to this guy with the 82nd patch on. He's like, hey, how you doing? You like my patch? I've got a quote from Charlemagne on my patch, buddy. In Latin, huh? <laughs> now, what do you think about that tough guy? Do you know who one of the, the GIs guarding the palace was? Senator Ted Kennedy. He was assigned to the palace at Fontainebleau. After uh, having some academic difficulty at Harvard, he uh, had to go into the army for a little while, but uh, his dad fixed it, so he got a sweet assignment. Here's another Cold War rarity. I don't know if I would have wanted this patch when I was in the service. It depicts what? The mushroom cloud. So these guys were in charge of the nukes. So you're all familiar with uh, Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project. Fat man and little boy, you know, uh, the bombs. Well, there weren't just the two that we dropped. There was a bunch of them, a dozen or so. And they had to be maintained. The tubes would, would wear out. The lead acid batteries would have to be changed. So people had to be trained on how to maintain the nuclear weapons. And this organization um, was formed in the, uh, the immediate years after the Cold War. And uh, they got this special patch to wear. And uh, we are fortunate enough to have one in our collection. Navy, I haven't forgotten about you. I know the Navy is big here. So when Captain Kirk needs to go faster, who does he call? Mr. Scott. Where does Mr. Scott work? Engineering. So the Derry sailor who wore this patch helped make this mighty aircraft carrier go. And it was the captain of the ship who would call down engineering to get more power on the Indy. So very, very famous um, uh, aircraft carrier. Another one uh, where a dairy man was stationed uh, was the Lexington. So we, we know that the original Lexington uh, went down, I think it was Midway, maybe? Coral Sea. Coral Sea. And this, well, the Midway, well, the original Lexington was sinking. This ship was being built as the cabin. But they called and they said, hey, we highly recommend uh, we change the name of the cabin to the Lexington because the previous Lexington has been lost in action. So they changed the name of the Cabot to the Lexington. So we had another Lexington. And this particular Lexington was given a very unusual camouflage pattern in blue, a disruptive blue, unique among some of the aircraft carriers. And the Japanese claimed that they sank this battleship about five times. But every time they claimed they sank it, it kept reappearing. Hence its name, the Blue Ghost. So we had a dairyman on the Blue Ghost. And as you can see, it acquitted itself extremely well uh, during the Second World War. And after the war, uh, it turned into a training ship. So carrier pilots would land on the Lexington to learn how to land and do carrier landings. And that's what that pitch, patch depicts there. So between 1962 and 1972, there were 300,000 carrier landings conducted on the Lexington, training all those pilots for the fleet and all the other uh, aircraft carriers. DJ, what does it say right under the, um, right under the ship? Uh, this, uh, CVT-16. Uh, no. Okay, no, right under the Training ship. pilots for the... Okay, yeah, training pilots for the fleet. Yeah, so it, it turned in, so I think uh, CVT means, you know, carrier training or something. And the initials are kind of... Weird. Oh, CV, uh, what is it? CVT. That's what it would mean, carrier training. CV means carrier. Carrier vessel um, training. By the way, camouflage never works at sea, but it makes sailors feel better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's true. Okay. Another patch I we received was from the USS Boston. And the USS Boston started out in World War II as a conventional uh, cruiser. 
And then in the Cold War, uh, some of its guns were removed and it was given uh, guided missiles. So as we see here, it's in its guise as a guided missile uh, carrier. And that's what the, uh, the patch uh, depicts. And you can see the missiles uh, taking off from the ship. And again, another ship with another distinguished uh, history. All right, Air Force, I haven't forgot you. If there's anybody who has as many patches as the Army, it's the Air Force. And there's just no keeping up with them. They're, every unit, every single unit has its own patch. And we, we are lucky to have a, a nice selection uh, given to us. And they wear them like on their breast pocket of their, of their uh, fatigue uniforms. And this particular patch was worn by what was then called the Tactical Air Command. So those were the fighter jocks. Now the Army guys and Navy guys and Marines call the Air Force guys zoomies because they're always zooming around in their fighter jets. But the fighter jets were once flown by the pilots of the Tactical Air Force, the TAC. They all talk with their hands. Yes. <laughs> all right, so this is my final slide, ladies and gentlemen. And again, thank you for uh, hanging in there on this whirlwind tour. And uh, just, again, to give you, you know, nicknames. So this patch is that of the Central Command, as CNN would call it. General Schwarzkopf used to refer to it as CENTCOM. But the average Joe, yeah, SADCOM. <laughs> And as you can see, we've gone from full color to the subdued, and now with the fighting in the desert, it's in desert tan. And that's uh, kind of where, uh, where we, we are with patches to this day. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And just a final uh, reflection here for all of our veterans in the audience. And uh, just take a moment to read it. Uh, you, don't, you don't get to pick your wars. You could join and find yourself in the Mekong Delta, or you could find yourself at the Palace of Fontainebleau. It's all uh, luck of the draw, but no matter where you served, uh, you, you took that chance that uh, you, you might end up making the, uh, the ultimate sacrifice. So I just wanted to, uh, to put that out there for all the veterans who uh, bequeathed uh, this wonderful gift uh, on our town. And uh, as I said, uh, if you ever want to know more about a certain patch, Mark's got the uh, museum open on Sunday afternoons. Just come on over and we'll, uh, we'll talk for another four or five hours on it. But you. thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. For, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, anybody have any questions? Is anybody still awake, first of all? <laughs> come on, that was good. Okay, anybody have any questions?